and you'll see it shrinking now, it's getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. And you'll see the green flag. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. It's reduced down into a tiny lump of metal. The copper working starts right out in the Middle East about 8,000 years ago in a place called Timnan, Syria, on the Israeli border. And uh, somebody found a, a small nugget of copper, a bit of natural copper. They'd taken stone tools they were used to using and they forged the copper out into a, a thin rod, folded the end over, and made a um, and a sewing needle, and it, it's quite lovely that it's something really useful and, and completely safe and practical. If you were to get down on your hands and knees in Syria and crawl backwards, you'd probably just about make England in a lifetime. It'd be really slow and painful, but it, you'd just about do it in about 40 years, wouldn't you, if you did a little bit every day. The bizarre thing is it takes thousands and thousands of years for that technology to arrive here. It arrives in the Italian Alps about 5,000 years ago. And it still takes another six or 700 years to arrive here. But the strange thing is they're selling stone axes from an adjacent valley to here, but not copper axes. So the technology of metalworking is very um, withheld. It's almost like a secret thing that if you can make blades, you're not going to teach your neighbours who you don't like and they get on with very well. You're not going to teach them how to make it. Copper blade technology starts to develop and it does start to spread across the Mediterranean, around the Mediterranean, up to Europe, but it's incredibly slow transfer. By the time daggers reach the British Isles, and we're working copper daggers around 2200 BC, they've already developed the beginnings of the sword three times as long in Spain, Sardinia. Do you want an introduction? <laughs> this is your new curator of the Bronze Age in uh, Edinburgh. He's just recently taken up the post there and is learning as much as he can about the sort of grubby end of bronze work. <laughs> the bronze we're using today is tin. It's uh, tin I'm used to, um, an alloy I'm used to working with. And it, I first discovered it because it's used in the GM late bronze age swords. All the swords are roughly 12% tin. And it's the most accurate. Um, alloy measurements I've seen to across Europe, so they're very careful to get 12%. It obviously works very well for them. Once you add a tiny bit of tin to it, it completely transforms into a hard metal. It becomes a metal that's much easier to cast because it flows like a liquid much better. And it's also incredibly hard compared to copper. So if you look at something like this, it's been um, cast in about 12% bronze. It's um, incredibly hard. There's nothing to be done to it. It's just as it's come out of the mold. So, so what starts out as a dagger, they take the idea and they start to make it longer and longer and longer. It's a lot of pressure on the smith to produce longer blades, and you can almost look at the Bronze Age as a way of, a way of gauging the development. It's just by blade, because it's the most important military matter of the day, is how big is your blade. So, the daggers become dirks in Scotland, longer daggers, but they are technically the sword, and then they become rapiers, which is something like this. This is just the pouring cup on the end, so you'd lose that. And the handle would be riveted on, so you get 
90 something percent of the casting is blade edge. So it's very important to go for as much blade edge in your uh, product as possible. What I'm going to do in a second is I'm going to lift the bronze out of the fire and pour it into two moulds. We've got two moulds. One is the shaft of a pin and the other is the disc on the top of it. This is really important. It's found at doors and I saw it yesterday and it's absolutely exquisite and I'll show you what it looks like when it's finished. But suddenly realised these pins are probably the second ultimate status symbol about a thousand BC here in Scotland with the swords at the primary and the pin seems to be associated with several swords and they're some of the finest swords ever found in the British Isles are these swords in Scotland and the pins are a part of the ownership You'll see. The, the decorations put on afterwards. The, 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 yeah, the, the, the circles are they're included in it, but the the lines are added, and uh, it's just absolutely exquisite. So I have a feeling that it's actually the disc is the sun. It's a representation of the sun on a pin. Oh! It's hard to come out of this. So this is just the um, the top of the, the pin. And it hasn't got, it hasn't got the line decoration. Mm. I'm actually surprised how well it's cast. Wow. That's uh, unexpected. <laughs> So this is the pin. Let's <coughs> see. Mm -hmm. It is lava. Oh, that's quite a tricky one, this somewhere over 1100 degrees wow. at the moment. Can you see it's still liquid? Whoa. Do you want to hold it? Yeah, it's struggled to get to the edge of the face, right? It's not bad, it's not too bad. So it's got quite a resin to it. The interesting thing is, you've probably never heard a sound like this until the arrival of metal. So. The thing that surprised me most was how well the copper axe worked. And there wasn't. Um, Works quite well, Susan. <laughs> the, the way axe is depicted on stone hands, daggers are, are shown with handles pointing down, but the axes are shown as if they're held like this. And I wonder if uh, yep. has some kind of meaning in the past. The resonance of it had some kind of connotation with something. But the decoration always covers the whole axe, even though the half would cover most, could more than 50% of it. 